This is the sermon for the second Sunday in Lent. This morning we are reading from Genesis, the 22nd chapter, beginning with the first verse. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose, and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they both went together, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand, and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy, or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Like several other iconographic Sunday school stories, the story of Abraham and Isaac has always been disturbing to me, to say the very least. Like the story of the Flood, it caused me at a young age to question, why would a God, we were taught is the epitome of love, do such a thing? I certainly could understand the idea of a test. I was in those days a student, of course. I had tests all the time. And even then, those tests made sense to me in a way. I could understand their value as teaching tools, and even as a motivation to excel. But this test, the test that God laid on Abraham, first God tells the man he will be the father of many nations. Then he has to wait until both he and his wife are of extremely advanced age, 
The body is almost as good as dead, we are told, before he can even have a son. Then he is told that God wants him to sacrifice that son. Now perhaps you were told something similar to what I was told when I was younger. God needed to know that Abraham loved God, or in the language of the text, feared God even more than he loved Isaac. Add to that, particularly in the Lutheran understanding of my childhood, that the would-be sacrifice of Isaac is seen as foreshadowing the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And, yes, even at a young age, I... I understood the theology of it. God is supposed to be more important than anything else in our lives, even our children. Though if God says, kill your child, well, then I suppose you do it. But it bothered me in more ways than I have time today to enumerate. Here are just a few of the thoughts that I had. What kind of relationship would Isaac have with his father in the future? What was that trip back down Mount Moriah like? Did Isaac ask his father, Dad, were you really going to kill me up there and burn up my bloody corpse? Do you suppose maybe Isaac had trust issues after that? Why... Didn't Abraham at least try to bargain? He didn't seem above bargaining on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. Gee, God, if there are 20 righteous people in the city, would you spare it? How about 10? Do I hear 10? Why didn't Abraham at least say something like, Okay, God, if you need blood, take mine. Kill me instead. Just not my son. But I can give Abraham a pass more easily uh, than I can give God, at least the way God is depicted here. Why, God? Why is it so important to make sure this special person you've called to be the father of monotheism, the father of many nations, needs to be so filled with fear? But then... Leaving the story of Abraham and Isaac for just a moment, are not the scriptures filled with equally horrific things that God seems to ask people to do? Uh, the story of Noah, as we discussed last week, has God destroying an entire race. Abraham himself is effectively commanded to commit genocide in order to occupy the promised land. The national ordinances of Israel, thought to be handed down from God himself, prescribed stoning to death as a punishment for numerous crimes we would consider laughable today. And yet the same teachers who taught me that God is fearsome and that indeed it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living and apparently very angry God, also taught me that God is love. He is full of mercy. He is forgiving, and he is unchanging. I don't get it, I asked, annoying my Sunday school teacher for the umpteenth time. Which is it? Asking an old man to murder his son, even if it was always just a test, isn't very loving. Neither is picking one group of people to be chosen and telling them it's okay to run roughshod over everyone else. And the answer might have gone something like this. That was the Old Testament. In the New Testament, God shows his loving side through Jesus. Oh, I wouldn't buy it. At least I wouldn't buy it for long. And I hope you won't either. I will confess that I, I tried to buy it for long enough, I suppose. I tried to buy the official party line. It was, after all, the faith of my childhood and, in a way, my birthright. But somehow it wouldn't stick. Let me just get this part out of the way. 
the God that is so insecure that it needs to test us by saying, do you love, or in this case, fear me so much that you'd kill your own child, is not a God that I particularly want to worship. Plain and simple. So if that really is God, go ahead and strike me dead right now because I'm simply not going to go along with that. I'm sure in a lot of ways I'm a coward to, compared to what Abraham was. In, in fact, realistically, I'm a paunchy, middle-aged man living a relatively comfortable life. Mostly, I've never been in want for any necessity. As the song goes, I've never been tested. But I have made lots of mistakes in life. And there are certainly those who would question my moral fiber even to the extent of telling me I have no right to wear a clerical collar. Perhaps. But what little fiber I do have, whatever marginal spiritual guts I can muster up, compels me to say, no way. I'm not going to worship a god that plays with infanticide as a test. I'm not going to worship a god that commands genocide or even imposes impossible religious regulations that have the end result of creating a desperate and morally dissolute people. I'm not sure how many viewers I just lost with that statement. But for those of you who are still watching, I'm ready to talk about the very best I can do with this difficult text. Last week, and in previous addresses, I've suggested that a flat, literalist reading of Scripture will get us into a place of spiritual murkiness. Last week, I made the statement that the Bible as we understand it is at least as much an anthropological book as it is a spiritual one. If you look at the Bible as a record of man's attempt to understand not only God, but the world around him, and perhaps most importantly himself, then we may be able to make some sense of today's text and a whole lot of other seemingly ugly, grotesque God stories. To begin, Abraham, presuming he was a real person, lived in a time before the Jewish nation came together, a time when, though we don't like to talk about it, child sacrifice was, if not common, at least an accepted practice. It seems, by the way, that the issue comes up a number of times later, to the extent that God has to instruct the children of Israel, no, don't sacrifice your children the way the Gentiles do. Don't sacrifice them to me. Don't sacrifice them to anything else. It's simply wrong. For example, Leviticus 20, 2 through 5 states, Say to the Israelites, Any Israelite or any foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to Moloch is to be put to death. The members of the community are to stone him. I myself will set my face against him and will cut him off from his people. For by sacrificing his children to Moloch, he has defiled my sanctuary and profaned my holy name. If the members of the community close their eyes when that man sacrifices one of his children to Moloch, and if they fail to put him to death, I myself will set my face against him and his family, and will cut them off from their people, together with all who follow him in prostituting themselves to Moloch. Other Old Testament passages as well, in equally strong and violent language, would seem to affirm God's zero tolerance for child sacrifice. So at the beginning of the story of Abraham and Isaac, we have a God saying, go ahead and kill your son as a sacrifice. At the end of the story, the angel of the Lord is saying, wait, don't do that. In fact, 
use that ram instead. Now, if we take this story in light of later context, the stern prohibition against child sacrifice, and we remind ourselves that just maybe these scriptures are in fact about mankind's understanding of its deities, then the story becomes the first step in a progression, and the voice of God that perhaps Abraham obeyed was not the voice to initially bind Isaac and play out a human sacrifice, but the voice that said, stop, stop all of this, no more human sacrifice. But if we take that tack, it is only the first step. For the time we get to the time of King David, the psalmist seems to be well aware that God has no interest in the sacrifices of animals. The sacrifice of God are a broken and contrite heart, writes the psalmist in Psalm 51. And by the time we get to Hosea, we have God purportedly speaking through the words of the prophet, saying in chapter 6, I want mercy, not sacrifice. Want to do something good? Don't burn up animal carcasses on the altar. Instead, feed the hungry. Care for the widow and the orphan. If we view the arc of scriptural history as a gradual, if far from linear, growing understanding, we may trace the understanding of God from barely more than that of very primitive man who believes he can appease the gods with the savory smells coming from burnt flesh to an understanding of God that does not need to eat or drink, nor does this God need to prove God's self to us, but rather does desire that we exhibit justice and, above all, mercy and love. If this is the case, then the children of Abraham are not those who blindly follow the unquestioned faith of their fathers, but rather those who are gradually moving away from the sacrificial mechanisms, from the violent understandings imposed by our collective cultures. To be a child of Abraham, when viewed in this light, is to understand the voice of God, which says, Listen, put down the knife. But here is where it becomes difficult, and on some level I will put out concepts that I know will become stumbling blocks, that I know very well may offend. You see, we still have much to learn from this story. For just as the children of Israel, as late as Isaiah at least, kept coming back to child sacrifice for whatever reason, so we in our culture continue to sacrifice human lives, our sons and our daughters, our elderly, our downtrodden, those who, like Isaac, don't stand much of a chance of fighting back. We continue to sacrifice human lives to our gods. It's true that, for the most part, we don't worship Moloch. At least we don't think that we do. Instead, our gods have wondrous-sounding names like freedom or opportunity. Sometimes we call them by other names like capitalism or the American way. When the sons and now daughters we sacrifice come home missing limbs, we pin medals on their beautiful uniforms. When they return in pine boxes or black bags, we honor them with moving ceremonies, and we use the language of sacrifice. We laud and glory and honor them for their sacrifice. Those whom we send to pass their bodies through the fires of the Moloch we call war. While at home, we use the freedom we believe their sacrifice is bought for us to sacrifice the poor and weakest among us to ever-expanding corporate profits. We hedge the market and play both sides of the game. 
the working poor cannot afford homes, and the unemployed poor cannot get jobs. We sacrifice the environment, the very creation itself, in the name of the God of expedience and progress. More oil, more natural gas, more minerals and metals. Keep the God of commerce happy. Keep the hungry deity of consumerism appeased. But those who claim to be of the seed of Abraham, maybe, maybe if we listen, will hear the voice of God saying, Stop! Put down the knife! Stop this sacrificial mechanism. Learn to live instead of killing. Learn to love instead of hating. Move from the primitive mind that can only understand the universe as transaction. If I give the gods this, they will look with favor on me. But rather look to the consciousness of Christ that recognize all human beings as brothers and sisters, where war and hate are diseases to be cured, and the perceived scarcity that turns us into hoarders and murderers is but a deception of our own minds. Brothers and sisters, test my words. Test them against the alternative. And if you find some sense in what I have said, go then not only to live in peace, but even to be bringers of peace. In Christ's name.